Max Highlights. And here's your host, Louise Houghton. Hello, and thanks for tuning in to the show. We have a festive start to the program today, so let's find out what's on the way. <laughs> Bright idea, La Fête de Lumière lights up Lyon. Leap of faith, the daredevil stunts of Scottish trials biker Danny McCaskill. And ancient world, we visit the Roman town ruins of Herculaneum. The 8th of December marks a French Lyonnaise tradition that's become known as the Festival of Lights. Back in the 17th century, when the city was struck by the plague, residents promised to pay tribute to Mary, the mother of Jesus, if the town was spared. And so, for centuries, locals held an annual candlelit procession in her honour, which, in today's mid-digital world, has turned into a spectacular four-day event. <laughs> Lyon looks as though it's under a spell. More than 70 light installations have turned the city on the Rhone River into a fabulous backdrop full of art and poetry. Even those who know the French city well can now experience it from an entirely new perspective. One of the high points of the festival is the light show by Lyon-based artist Gilbert Coudin. The whole city flocks to this festival, even if it's cold or snowing. Even those who don't get out much come to see it. The exhibits often tell little stories, like this one about the history of cinematography. Two pioneers in the field, the Lumiere brothers, were born in Lyon. At the other end of the city, cartoon Inuit have discovered a playground on the facade of the city's opera house. About four million visitors hit the streets of the city during the four nights of the festival. I live in Lyon, and usually it's a very quiet city, but now there are tourists from all over the world here. I come to see the light festival every year. It was originally a religious festival, but then technology slowly got the upper hand. And the religious roots of the event have now disappeared almost entirely. Just a few more hours until the premiere. On the Place des Terreaux, in the heart of the city, Gilbert Coudin concentrates on his sound check. He's the first artist actually from Lyon to win the international competition to provide the central installation. We ran through the show 10 times yesterday and everything went well. But we realized that we could improve things just a little bit more. Coudin is the founder of the Cité Création Artists Collective, which is renowned for the large-scale frescoes it has created in cities all over the world. Light design is his new passion. It's fascinating to combine light and color and movement. But you have to pay close attention, as over the course of the show, I want to make people feel and think. And to do that, you need a story. Some artists also rehearsed here in a regional administrative center until right before the official opening. French light artist Jean-Luc Hervé, here on the left, turned one modern structure into a spiritual place, a cathedral of light and water. There's no overarching theme at the festival. You're only limited by the location and the bounds of your own artistic freedom. You have to transform the location with light or video effects. We work with light and synchronize it with a musical score. Back to the Place des Terreaux, where Gilbert Coden is bringing paintings to life. He projects artworks from the museum onto its facade. Mm 
content quand, quand les gens... Well, I'm happy when people smile, feel good and forget everything for a minute or two and dive into this dream world. Être dans une sorte de rêve comme ça. The power of light. Once again, the city of Lyon turns Northern Europe's darkest month into a celebration. Now, in many parts of the world, bicycles are used as a mode of transport, but some people prefer to use them recreationally. In the last few decades, we've seen bikes modified for certain sports on the market, and the latest to come to our attention are trials bikes. These are fitted with shock absorbers and a low seat for when extreme sportsmen like Danny McCaskill perform their jumps, flips, spins and all kinds of other tricks. Leisurely bicycle outings are not Danny McCaskill's thing. The Scottish trials biker tracks down unusual shortcuts. For me, the, my favourite thing about trials biking is the freedom to do whatever you want. When I go out riding in a city, I'm always looking at the walls, the rails, you know, the curbs, everything as a, as a giant place to sort of ride my bike. It all started with this amateur video that displays McCaskill's bicycling art. His roommate, David Sowerby, shot and edited it and posted the clip on the internet in April 2009. Within 40 hours, the post had been seen 350,000 times. Since then, the short clip has been viewed 36 million times. Even professional cyclist Lance Armstrong was fascinated, and he encouraged people to watch the video. Danny McCaskill has lived in Glasgow for two years now. His videos have made him a star, and not just on the internet. Nowadays, people recognize him on the street. They want to take photographs of him. I watch all his films, all his awesome, really good, good inspiration for the kids. And he's, he's made the revolutionized bike in world higher than it's ever been because he's bringing new tricks and new ways to it. McCaskill is still surprised at his popularity. When I was younger, I never had a goal to be a professional rider, you know, and I really find my situation now very surreal. You know, I kind of made this first main video just for fun with my friend um, and I never really quite realized what impact it would have. Trials biking has been around since the 1970s. McCaskill has been practicing since he was four years old and he works on some tricks for years before he perfects them. Spills and injuries are part of the job. Definitely had a number of broken bones over the years. Um, I mean countless ones really. Uh, but I mean, I just, I don't even look at it as a setback at all. It's just a, a case of healing up and then getting back onto the bike. After the great success of his first video, companies like Red Bull signed him to a contract. Now he can devote himself entirely to his sport. In Edinburgh and other parts of Scotland, he shot the clip called Way Back Home. It's now been viewed 34 million times. While shooting this video, Danny injured himself so seriously that he was in the hospital for months. But afterward, he finished the film. The minutely planned films always tell little stories. One called Imaginate is about a young boy's dreams. I think it's very important that you have like a, some kind of theme. I mean, often it's like a, a story or a, or a sort of journey. You know, you're often, often sort of traveling from A to B. And I think that makes a big difference. McCaskill usually comes up with the stories and scouts out the locations himself. He gets his ideas from talking with friends. He also talks with them about his future. Riding the trials bike is quite physically demanding and I know I can't do it forever, you know, but I'll certainly try my best to be, to be riding for the next few years. And as long as he can ride, he'll keep making these creative clips. Like this one in a flood-ravaged town in Argentina. Danny McCaskill is thinking about putting together an entire bicycle show. Until then, fans can enjoy his cycling skill on the internet. 
And another kind of adrenaline fueled sport is skiing or snowboarding on the mountaintops. Ski season in the Swiss Alps is once again underway and thousands will be flocking to the most popular resort of St Moritz to join in the 150th anniversary celebrations. The Engadine Valley around St Moritz. This alpine landscape has helped create the idyllic notions of the winter wonderland Switzerland. A century and a half of winter sports tourism has left its traces here in the southeast of the country. It all started small, but now the village of 5,000 souls hosts up to 25,000 people at any given moment during high season. The light, the mountains, they're definitely a key factor. And then there's the Grand Hotel, which was developed at a very early stage, and the life it brought with it. Development began here at the Hotel Klum. In 1864, its director, Johannes Batwut, laid the cornerstone for the winter tourism industry. Back then, visitors to the exclusive hotel only came during the summer months. Batwut wagered with six English guests that in winter they could sit out on the terrace in shirt sleeves and promise to cover their travel costs if they couldn't. The hotelier won his bet, and from that year on, the guests came back every winter. St. Moritz quickly turned into a watering hole for the rich and famous. Its glamour drew increasingly prominent guests. In the 60s, they included jet set couple Gunter Sachs and Brigitte Bardot. They came for the skiing and the parties. For big balls back then, they would flood the dining rooms when they decided to go with the Venetian motif. They did a lot of really crazy, fantastic things. It was an exciting time. Even in Switzerland, there are few streets that can compare with the St. Moritz shopping mile. German fashion designer and filmmaker Willy Bogner likes to visit the luxury stores with his wife Sonia. He knows the village well. After all, he shot about 30 of his films in St. Moritz. I interviewed the Shah of Iran upstairs, as well as lots of other people who've been here. Jana Anelli from Fiat, for example. Back in those wild days, it was pretty much non-stop. <laughs> Bogner has spent his winters in St. Moritz for over 50 years. This is where he won his first major alpine ski race. I remember how it felt to be 17 here, what that felt like, and compare it to how it feels today. What hasn't changed is the fun everyone has with skiing. Back then we had it with our old wooden planks, and nowadays you have it with an ultra-modern pair. The best known ski resorts here are on the local mountains, Corvilia and Corvach. They offer a range of experiences, from classic alpine runs to deep snow free skiing. There are optimal conditions for very good skiers, not just those groomed white flat slopes for beginners. During the winter, we have a lot of fresh snow. It is just amazing. Yeah, really fun, definitely. Not so. So it's. It's challenging, but not too much. Winter tourism was marketed by St. Moritz early on. Even then, it usually targeted an exclusive clientele, as this exhibition of old posters shows. Just like in the rest of Switzerland, a winter vacation in St. Moritz doesn't come cheap. One reason tourist numbers have been falling over several years now. Events like the 150-year anniversary are aimed at turning that around. Willy Bogner does what he can to advertise. The most exciting thing about this sport is the youth scene. It's very creative and always searching for something new in order to compare it with what doesn't change. That experience of nature, being up on the mountain alone, the view, that doesn't change. The Swiss Alps have been calling winter sports fans for 150 years. Lots of things have changed here, but the magic of the mountains endures. 
come spring, many of us want to do a clear out and get rid of old clothes. And one Swiss company called Tritag have come up with a novel idea. Why not buy clothes that are biodegradable in the first place and then you can help protect the environment when you no longer want them by just slinging them directly onto the compost heap. Almost everything about this clothing is organic. Every fiber and even the buttons are biodegradable and leave behind no toxic residue. The garments come from the Zurich workshop of the brothers Daniel and Marcus Freitag. Their first line of sustainable clothes is called F Fabric. Do we make fashion? We make fabric <laughs> and create fashion from it. We wanted to have work clothes that are consistent with our principles, and they're not so easy to find. So we decided to make it ourselves. They hunted for biodegradable fabrics from environmentally friendly producers and came up empty-handed. So they developed fabrics themselves from bast hemp and flax. After five years, they'd done it, complete with a patented solution for trouser buttons. Natural fibers are biodegradable as long as they haven't been in contact with too many or the wrong chemicals. In our case, everything from the thread to the buttons are compostable. But the buttons are metal. So we came up with another strategy. These can be unscrewed and reused on the next pair of trousers. The Freitags came to fame in 1993 with a recycling concept. They began making bags out of old tarps from trucks. Every component had a previous life. The bags quickly found buyers around the world. Today, there are 40 models. The success inspired the brothers from Zurich to continue their sustainable production principle. Instead of upcycling, they went into cradle-to-cradle -cradle fashions. All the materials are part of a never-ending cycle modeled after nature itself. Freitag is about cycles. We breathe new life into old trucks and produce bags from parts of them. This atmosphere, this cyclical thinking is central to the concept. Fully biodegradable fashion is nothing new. One of the pioneers was the German textile company Trigema. Their organic cotton products carry the cradle-to-cradle -cradle certificate. All the raw materials used can theoretically become nutrients again. The Puma Sporting Goods label shifted into biodegradable materials in 2013. Trend researcher Karin Frick says collections like these are trailblazers. In future, we'll be wearing more environmentally friendly garments, clothing that has been produced sustainably, according to fair trade principles. But the clothes won't look like they were produced that way. Right now, these eco-trousers are an environmental statement and not a fashion statement. The Freitag brothers want to unite sustainable and stylish. They ambitiously follow a holistic approach, with production only in Europe. Hemp and flax are grown in Normandy, in France. The fibers are spun into thread in Italy and then woven into fabrics there as well. Finally, the garments are stitched together in Poland. All the steps take place within a 2,500 kilometer radius of Zurich. The brothers have made an advertising film to promote their credo of making fashion fair and sustainable. Smart advertising is really decisive for environmentally friendly fashion. You need to reach the masses. Sustainable underwear has been available for years in supermarkets, but it's not stylish. Style needs a special cool moment. And a good story. This t-shirt returns to the soil and could provide the organic matter to grow another hemp plant one day. This one was composted for two months. Even the tagua nut buttons broke down. And after six months, even the trousers decayed. It's become clear to us that what happens during composting troubles people. They're worried their clothes will break down in the wash. It's important to explain that lots of small insects and climatic conditions are required for the t-shirts to decompose. The brothers are selling their new line in their Zurich shop. They're still making just t-shirts, trousers and pinafores in three different colors. The prices range from 70 to 200 euros and they want to give consumers more to choose from. In the future, it'll be the raw material for any type of creation. 
Sure, if the story and the concept continue to develop, we've already got an international reputation. We've decided to follow a direction in which we're not aiming at just one little niche. They started small with bags way back when. Now they want to build on their success with garments that can be thrown onto the compost heap with a clear conscience when their time is up. Well, there are always some things that are good to be preserved, and I'm not just talking about clothing. The old town of Herculaneum in Naples, Italy, was destroyed by hot gas and rock over 2,000 years ago. The ruins are still standing, though, and visiting this ancient world makes for a rather reflective trip. Naples is the city at the foot of Mount Vesuvius. The magnificent volcano is still a threat. Its last eruption was only 70 years ago, and the Neapolitans have learned to live with the risk. Nearly one million people call the metropolis home. We're simple people. Our sense of community is very important. If things go wrong and someone needs help, we're there for each other. Naples' historic center is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's one reason why more than a million tourists come each year. Its museums are especially popular, including the Museo di Capodimonte, with art dating back to the Middle Ages through the Renaissance. A visit to Herculaneum takes you even further back into the history of the region. The lost city is just a half an hour from Naples by train. The devastating eruption of Mount Vesuvius in the year 79 AD left the town buried and preserved for posterity. Archaeologist Domenico Carmado takes us on a journey through the lost city. Here we find ancient Roman buildings that are completely preserved up to the third floor. What is unique is that timber such as door and window frames has been preserved. And this makes it easy for us today to reconstruct what life was like 2,000 years ago. Unlike nearby Pompeii, where the ashes of Vesuvius destroyed many houses, Herculaneum was subjected to a quick flow of hot gas and rock. That's why the smallest details, such as mosaics and frescoes, can still be admired today, nearly 2,000 years after the disaster. The remains of the former city dwellers are a poignant highlight of Herculaneum. As the disaster took its course 2,000 years ago, around 250 people sought shelter in these closely packed boathouses. But it was in vain. The residents were surprised by the volcanic eruption and the heat preserved their bodies in a matter of seconds. They're sitting just as they were 2,000 years ago. For example, this family whose mother was holding a child in her arms. Ancient Roman jewels and coins show that they fled here with all their possessions, hoping they could be rescued. The virtual archaeological museum at the edge of the excavation site shows how Herculaneum was before the eruption. Hands-on exhibits and a 3D cinema with panoramic views bring the terror of the volcanic eruption to life. Back in Naples, we visit the narrow alley of San Gregorio Armeno. Here, nativity figures are sold year-round. The handmade painted objects are a popular souvenir. And even whet your appetite for a real pizza margarita. Legend has it, it was invented at Pizzeria Brandi 125 years ago. La pizza margarita. This pizza was first made at the request of the Italian Queen Margarita and in her honor was baked in the national colors, the red tomato sauce, the white mozzarella and green basil. And it's still prepared that way today. 
a classic Neapolitan dish that's now a favorite around the world. And that is all we have time for on the show today. And I won't be with you again until next year. So do enjoy the festivities if you're celebrating. Take care of yourselves and Merry Christmas. Bye-bye for now.